production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Congressman Steve Cohen, tonight on Behind the Headlines. Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. We are joined tonight by Steve Cohen, House of Representatives, District 9. Thanks for being here. Good to be here. Is this behind the headlines or behind the hairlines? Behind the headlines. It's behind the headlines. <laughs> yes. Along with Bill Drees, senior reporter with the Memphis Daily News. The You're best a reporter You're... to all of Memphis. There we go. Thank you. Um, so we will start, uh, we joked before uh, the show, there's no news to talk about in your world in the Congress. But, uh, you know, obviously you're a Democrat, you've been a big criti critic of Trump. Um, what do you hear, though, from local constituents? You've done some town halls recently. W what do you hear pro and con about President Trump? I hear a lot of uh, con. Uh, I don't hear much pro. It's a very unusual time. We have a president who's not qualified to be president of the United States. And he puts social service projects, whether it be health care, which he wants to eliminate, national health care, uh, Meals on Wheels, SNAP payments, LIHEAP programs, Choice Neighborhood grants through HUD, HUD funding, all on the chopping block. National Endowment for the Arts, National Endowment for the Humanities, PBS, chopping block. And on the foreign policy scene, he puts us at jeopardy. What he's doing with Kim Jong-un is embarrassing yeah. to the and United States and to the office of president. Right. And I should say, we're taping this Thursday afternoon, and who, there's been a lot going on this week, so by the time this airs, even more, could, more statements could be made, just to clarify. We could be duck and covering. Right. Um, it's before your time. Right. No, no, no. I remember ducking. I remember the ducking coverage. I actually, I'm, I do remember that. But when you say, you know, not qualified, why then, from your point of view, was he elected? He was elected because there were a lot of people that were angry at Washington, which is somewhat understandable, and the whole idea of draining the swamp. And the idea was that they would be more responsive to helping people get jobs, get additional income to enjoy the American dream. A lot of people who are not enjoying the American dream in the Rust Belt states and the rural areas and have not had that opportunity. And it, which is a valid concern, right? I mean, a, there, is, there is a lot of, of, of there are trouble in those areas. And there's so his trouble. message reson, resonated in a way that, that Clinton's did not, apparently. Right. It resonated. And people thought that Hillary Clinton and the Democrats were spending too much time concerned about the uh, let's say the software of the American uh, political system, uh, whether it was making it more just, extending voting rights, expanding civil rights, not only among uh, racial, but also sexual orientation and gender, uh, um, and trying to, to, to make America a, a more tolerant and inclusive country. And they were more concerned about, I think, everyday dollar and cents and what's going in my pocketbook. And Trump appealed to them but the sad thing is, he hasn't done anything to quote unquote change the swamp. He's, the idea would be that you'd get money out of politics, you'd be responsive to the people, and you wouldn't be a Wall Street, Goldman Sachs lackey. He's brought more Goldman Sachs people into government than ever cumulatively before. He's brought more billionaires and or multimillionaires into government and less grassroots people, yeah. he has taken policies that will hurt the constituents who voted for him, taking away health care from people who need it, Medicaid, Meals on Wheels and all, and they seem to still like The, the Apprentice Show. Right, but, but and they'll go to Bill, and yet, although his approval ratings are not, are, are pretty low, um, among the core Republican base, among the, his core supporters, he still has a tremendous popularity. And so there's still some message that, the, that they don't seem to care, from, to, to argue the other point of view, that there are billionaires there and Goldman Sachs there. They still feel like that, that the Republican Party, which controls the Senate and the House, um, and now the presidency, that they are somehow speaking to them in a way that Democrats aren't in these rural areas. And this is true in Tennessee politics. You know, you were in the state House, or state, and the state Senate. 
that something about the message of Democrats doesn't resonate with the people you're talking about. Well, maybe I should have started with the fact that Hillary Clinton got the most votes. So, I mean, we're not talking about any great dynamic shift. She got the most votes. She lost the Electoral College, which I think is uh, lost its, its, its cause. I mean, it had a good purpose, but it failed. Its purpose was to have electors who the public knew better than they knew the presidential candidates make a wise decision and see to it that a, a narcissistic sociopath without qualifications would not become president. Yeah. And that opportunity presented itself and the Electoral College failed. It should go back to grammar school. Uh, so he didn't get the popular vote. And where he did get the, the key votes in, in Wisconsin and in Pennsylvania and Michigan, the Hillary Clinton campaign was not there. They, they had bad numbers. I'm still not sure that the, the, the Russians were not uh, necessarily glued into social media in those states and directed through Trump. For sure, Comey, who I think is a man of rectitude. The, the FBI director who was fired by Trump in the spring. His saying publicly against all Justice Department FBI policy of getting involved in any way in a national election within X amount of time and within 10 days was within that period of time. I think it's a couple of months. Uh, his coming out and saying that the Hillary Clinton campaign was reopened and reopened of, of all places the laptop of Anthony Weiner. Yeah, well, let's not go. We're going to go away. <laughs> Speaking of swamps, we're going to go away in the swamp. We'll come back to a bunch of what you said, but let me get Bill involved. Bill. So, Congressman, what, what do you see as your role during this Trump administration, during, during this, this time when Republicans have the majority in the House and, and the Senate? And, and, is, and is your role the same in regard to the Trump presidency as it is with the Republican majorities? Thank you for distinguishing that because it's a, different with the Trump presidency. I'm not going to have the successes I had with the Obama presidency of bringing in a $30 million choice neighborhood for, for South Memphis, New South Memphis at Foot Homes. So I'm not going to get a $15 million Tiger Grant for the Main Street to Main Street project. And we're not going to be able to rescue the American Steamship Company and those jobs down on the river. Uh, we're not going to bring in the first minority business center ever in Tennessee. Those things are part of, of history. And we're not going to recommend the judges and the U.S. attorney, et cetera. But with Congress, we can still be effective. And we did have a, a bill uh, that will deal with sexual trafficking uh, and, and require health care, set up a program where health care professionals will get trained to identify sexual trafficking victims, went through committee, and it will probably become law. Uh, we had success on our SEED Act. Uh, getting it into the FAA reauthorization to require the FAA to do a study of the size, width, and pitch of seats on airplanes to see if they are a safety problem, both from uh, deep, deep uh, uh, vein thrombosis for people sitting too long on intercontinental flights and on the evacuation possibilities where planes are supposed to be evacuated within three minutes if an emergency occurs, which I don't think they can be, and they haven't. And since we passed our amendment, which went in the bill, which may or may not become law, a federal judge has ruled that the FAA has not complied and that they do need to do that testing. So that was further support. So we've had some legislative successes and we'll continue to be the lead sponsor on rape kits, on appropriations to get more money for rape kit testing, even though I think Memphis has used enough of their money we're to, to catch up on rape kit testing. We're trying to get some funds also for additional uh, rape kit testing so it can be nice not just for the testing but for the storage and also for uh, uh, video recording uh, mm -hmm. police having uh, video for cameras. Body cameras yeah for body cameras that they can use that money for body cameras and for storage so we're still going to be effective on, on appropriations items we've got a lot of good friends on the Republican side and we've been most effective working with appropriations the Republican Congress people and the Democratic Congress people see things much more in common than the Trump presidency the Trump administration is really aberrant to the entire rest of the legislative political world. It is a, uh, a kind of a, an unusual uh, um, station. In, in even, even different than the Tea Party movement? There are a lot of, you know, would you distinguish him? It seems to me as just an observer that there's a lot of similarity there. But there's not. some similarity with the Tea Party, but the Tea Party wanted to go even further uh, than Trump wanted on some things. Uh, but the Tea Party is a minority in the Republican Party, too, and overall, most people see some wisdom and things. So we go back, one of the big issues we're going to face is going to be the debt ceiling. Yeah. 
and the Tea Party is going to be against the debt ceiling. Are they going to require some things of Paul Ryan that he will not be willing to do because they're not healthy for the American system, I think. And the, Paul Ryan's going to have to reach out to Democrats and get Democratic votes and some Republican votes to approve a clean debt ceiling. Do you think that it'll happen that way? It's happened that way in the past, right? That's yeah. prob probably yeah. what will yeah. happen. Go back to Bill here. Do, is there enough time in, I think, 50-something legislative days that, that you all have when you're back from the August recess? Is there enough time to tackle tax reform, and, and where are you on that? Well, I think tax reform is a good, uh, important issue for corporate tax reform, which is really, we, we pay a high corporate tax rate in this country, and a lot of companies have gone overseas and taken their jobs and their money overseas, and we need to repatriate it. And that's something we can work together on, but there, it, it, there's a price and there's a limit, that, but there needs to be probably a, a, a spot where you lose more money than you gain. But we need to I think, bring that money home. The personal income tax rates, it all needs to be get, geared toward the middle class in a major way. People are earning $200,000 a year, 250 at the most and less. And, and there's, a, it, there's a big difference in the incomes in, in a New York or San Francisco or Los Angeles and a Memphis. So, I, you know, I look at $100,000 as being a reasonable breaking point, but that's not an, for a, a person, a family where you get a teacher and a, and, a, and, a, and a first responder, you might have $100,000 cumulative income. In San Francisco or New York, that's going to be 150 or maybe more. Because of the cost of living. <laughs> cost of living is just mm -hmm. so much, so much more. But if you put the money in the middle class's hands, they'll spend it, and that inc helps your economy, and we're going to need help with the economy. Uh, if you put it as across the board, which Trump basically has, it's mostly going to go to the people who have the big bucks, the upper 1 percent, and they're going to get tens of thousands and tens of millions, in some cases hundreds of millions of dollars in tax breaks. <coughs> and that money won't stimulate the economy mm -hmm. and won't be healthy. But that's his constituency. As, as, a, <laughs> as a congressman, as, as a matter of, uh, of how this works, does this White House try to have an impact across the board, or, or is it more selective on what it tries to influence? And if it's more selective and doesn't try to weigh in on everything or weigh in on everything specifically, what happens in that political vacuum? Are you talking policy or are you talking about people? I, I'm talking about policy. You know, they, they weigh in. Health care was a big deal. He wanted to accomplish that, just like he wants to build the wall and he wants to do tax reform. Uh, he had certain issues he talked about in the campaign, and he wants to accomplish those. It's not necessarily the policy in itself. It's the accomplishment of doing it, mm -hmm. and he's big on that. Uh, yeah, the health care plan was liked by 15 percent of the people in this country. It put 24 million people off of health care, destroyed Medicaid, which is for the most needy, and affects so many people in Shelby County and in my district, and he didn't seem to care. But even the skinny repeal, which affected 16 million people, it's astonishing that it was only Murkowski, Collins, and then John McCain that saved it, that there weren't other senators who saw the, the, the horror in eliminating 16 million people from health care and giving, it wouldn't give in tax breaks to some of the areas, but it gave some, and that's kind of what it was about, but it also gave up to the states' rights, and when you give the states the control over health care, in the South it means poor people are going to die. And when when you say those things, and there are people listening who you know a different persuasion, or you know part of the you know small percentage who supported that health care plan, uh, I'm thinking some of them are probably saying, well, but we can't afford it. And the same with the debt ceiling. And it's the argument of the Tea Party group, and I think the Freedom, you know, some of these Republican groups are saying, look, we're 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 spending way beyond our means. We need to do something. It, it's maybe terrible that we'd have to cut those people off Medicaid, but the federal government can't afford these things. The federal government can't keep borrowing more money. What, what is your response to that? federal government can afford it. Uh, we just need to tax the, re the rich people. And when I say the rich people, that's people with incomes. Really, significant taxes would be people over a million dollars in income. And if we tax those people at a proper rate, right now they're being, I mean, when Kennedy was president, they were being taxed at 90%. I think he cut it to 70 maybe. Now it's down. What's the top tax bracket? About 38 or 40? Right. 38 maybe? It's, there should be a, a major additional tax on the people earning over a million dollars. 
that's where the money is and the Trump administration wants to give those people tax breaks, right. not tax them, and he wants to eliminate the estate tax. And that's only on couples that earn over $10 million right. a year pay the estate tax, and he's not concerned about people who earn $11 million and would pay tax on that $1 million that's inherited. He's concerned about his family and people like them that estates may be worth a billion and they won't pay anything. Right. There's money. Let's go back. Skipping the estate tax, let's go back to the, the increase in the taxes on high income people. The argument on the other side is, well, these are the people, by and large, who create jobs, who do investments, and if you take money from them um, in the form of taxation, they're going to create less jobs, they're going to do less investing, and that's going to hurt the economy. Your response to that criticism? Balderdash. <laughs> Greed drives these people, and if they lose money, they're still going to want it. It's, it's like playing Monopoly. They want to control all the houses and, and, and then pass go and then not right. go to jail. And I should say, by the way, but, but I'm going to go to Bill in a second. There's about 10 minutes left. We had David Kustoff, Republican from the uh, Memphis area. We had Bob Corcoran recently. And so I'm sure there's some people listening saying, wait, they're just giving Steve this big platform. And so over the course of these shows, I think uh, we balance things out. But let me go back to Bill with 10 minutes left. When you, when you talk about the president's position on something, how malleable is it because he can he can get on Twitter at, at a at a certain time of night and the conditions on it will will change the conditions changed on replace and repeal to just repeal during the course of the health care bill and then today. it changed to destroy when right. you couldn't repeal it was just kill it hmm. through administrative cuts so 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 his position ha has been known to change and some of that and I don't think. He's necessarily unique in general as a president in wanting to have an accomplishment on, on his list of things that, that he's done without a particularly specific position on what it is that's done there. Well, he's certainly accomplishment oriented and it's all about, you know, adding to the Trump name and the Trump brand. Uh, you know, I don't think that's when you get into the sociopath idea. Sociopaths don't have philosophies. It's about themselves and aggrandizement and, and attention. And this man wants attention. He's not a normal human being. It's a scary time in America to have this man as president. And more and more Republicans are realizing it. Jeff Flake's book made it clear that the Republicans have sold their soul to have him and it's a danger to democracy. John McCain has made it pretty clear that he thinks the same thing. Lindsey Graham's getting close to have said that. There are others who've been sass. There are, and I have colleagues that tell me in private they are concerned about his health, and we're not talking about his being able to press weights, and but they aren't willing to come out publicly well, and say that. Well, you, you, the, and just for people, you know, Jeff Flake, who's the Arizona Republican senator, and the other Republican senators you just named off, who've, who've voiced concerns in various levels. Um, and there's some, at least, you know, comment, commentators saying, well, the Senate really is beginning to stand up to Trump. They, they stood up on uh, health care reform. Um, their, their investigation of the Russian interference, I think they think is maybe more robust. Um, why is that true? Is, is there more robust opposition to Trump in the Senate than in the House? And if so, why? Why, why are Republican House members not coming out and, and speaking in the way that Republican senators are? Senators have... They run every six years. House members run every two years. So senators aren't up, two-thirds of them, for four years or six years, and so that's different. Senators have healthier self-images. <laughs> a senator looks in the mirror and he sees a president. A House member might think he sees a senator, but he doesn't see a president necessarily. Uh, the Senate members have broader constituencies and have to be concerned about people who are being cut from the social programs and are minorities that are concerned about civil rights based on race, gender, sexual orientation, while a lot of reps have districts where they're not as many or as vocal a minority group. So senators have got a little bit better, larger perspective. And I think that's a, a lot of it. And then you know, you've got, you know, in the, in the House, we had an intelligence chairman who ran over to the White House and really made himself look like a fool going over there, finding, sneaking in at night and sh reading some papers and having a press right. conference, while in the Senate, the, the, the senator from North Carolina has stood up and been a star working with Mark Warner. 
So, well, I have uh, many questions on that. Let's let's get. I mean, people commentators will say it nationally, but let's try to make it local. That the way that districts, especially for the House of Representatives, are set up now causes so much lack of bipartisanship, so much polarization, because most House members on the left and the right aren't worried about losing to someone from the other party because of gerrymandering, because of redistricting. They're worried about someone more to the left of them or more to the right of them. Do you see that? I mean, do you see House There's members no who secretly are like, who are privately saying to you, yeah, yeah, I could support, I support that personally, but if I, if I go out and do that, I'm going to lose in the primary. Not the election, I'm going to lose in the primary. They're and, concerned about that, and a lot will be... Uh, maybe learned from what happens in Alabama. Does Trump's endorsement help Strange that much? I'm not sure where Strange... The, the, this is the Senate race. Senate race, race yeah. where he rated compared to Judge Moore and uh, Representative Brooks before the endorsement and how much of a difference it'll make. But if it does, it'll say something. Uh, the Democrats have been doing a lot better. We've won a couple of legislative seats in Oklahoma that, and one in, in Iowa, which were like 30-point or 20-point swings yeah. from the Trump days. So I think there, there is a mood that's changing but you're right, the gerrymandering makes the districts more primary-oriented, and the, in the Republican base, there is more Trump support, and there's, it, it is more conservative. Look, uh, jumping around, we've got maybe five minutes left here. Um, I mentioned uh, David Kustoff, the new um, uh, House member from the uh, Memphis area who was on the show a month or two ago. Do you work with him? Do you work with Bob Corker? Does the, Tennessee, did, you know, does the Tennessee delegation talk and say what's best for Tennessee, Democrat versus Republican, and, and kind of try to disregard some of that? Is there a there's formal not, or informal process of working together? Not really. I mean, there's not a Tennessee position. Some, sometimes, like, the, the hospital industry came to us in, in, in need of uh, some funding that we hadn't got disproportionate care and Diane Black and I carried the ball. It was a Republican from the Nashville area. Yeah, and Diane Black was my lead with that, and we worked together and got it done and got the monies for the hospitals throughout the state. Uh, we've had some other issues that you kind of come together to look out for a, if an industry group comes. But oftentimes, you, you, what you look out for is your district, and I, I'm not concerned about... Tennessee as much. I'm concerned about Memphis. I'm but concerned about, about the ninth district. who's right next to you? I mean, you, well, there, da there are joint district issues. Is mostly, would... David and I work together. We're friendly. Uh, there may be an issue. Jim Strickland came up, and there was an issue about uh, some HUD funding and a formula. Uh, and and I, I, David and I, you know, agreed that David might be the right guy to carry this to the administration because it's something with the administration. But we can work together. Okay, Bill. As you were holding your town hall meeting at the Memphis College of Art uh, a week ago as this, as this program airs, um, the local Democratic Party was reorganized a meeting just a couple of blocks away uh, over at the IBEW Hall. What, what's your impression of the re reorganization of the party and the dysfunction that, that prompted the state party to pull the plug on the old executive committee? The previous executive committee was dysfunctional. Uh, they didn't accomplish anything, and they didn't do a good job of getting a good slate of candidates to run for office that people could support. The Democrats have got the numbers in this county. We haven't had the candidates to get the numbers uh, out there to elect Democrats in countywide offices. Hopefully, the, this new group is an uh, impressive group. There are a lot of people on there I've got uh, high regard for. They're enthusiastic. They, they, they'll, they can do no worse, and I think they'll do a lot better. And I wish Corey Strong the best uh, of luck as being the chairman. And uh, we got county elections coming up in 18, and they need to have a good slate. We can't have people that uh, we've had in the past. I'm going to go stay local for a second. Um, you know, a lot of attention that uh, Trump has put on um, uh, undocumented uh, immigrants, uh, illegal immigrants, however, and ICE raids and sanctuary cities and this whole idea that local um, police forces and law enforcement should be rounding up people, should be investigating on behalf of the federal government. Um, a lot of mayors have pushed back on that. Others haven't. Federal funding is being talked about. You know, we're going to, the Trump administration says it's going to withhold federal funding if local government doesn't um, enforce um, immigration law. What is your, I, I think you're opposed to that, but what are you seeing and hearing from constituents about what seems to be an increase in raids and an increase in local activity? The people that were arrested in the raids here, Birmingham and New Orleans, were not necessarily people who had committed crimes uh, or where they should have been targets of ICE to arrest them and to deport them. That's, and Obama did a lot of that. Yeah, it, right. It dramatically but it was, but, increased but it under was, the Obama It was targeted to, towards people who committed serious crimes. Uh, these were people who not even not committed serious crimes, some of them, but most of them had committed no crime. 
They just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. It's a scare tactic. It was a scare technique. It's part of what I think overall is the danger we see to this republic. I had the great fortune to spend an hour and a half with Marvin Kalb, great broadcast journalist yep. of a, formerly Meet the Press. And he said, and I agree with him, that he's worried about our democracy. He said, I care about this country greatly. I came to this, my father came to this country from, from Russia. He was an immigrant, from Ukraine, in fact, uh, and it was an immigrant. And he's, this country gave him that opportunity, and he's concerned about it. And the first thing they do in an authoritarian regime is to go against the press and against the courts. And this administration has gone against the press and said the press are the enemies of the people, and they went against the courts and talked about so-called judges and attacked judges of uh, Hispanic heritage, saying they couldn't oversee a case fairly when it was about his university, his fake university, who he settled for $25 million worth yes. of fraud. Yes. And then they go after immigrants, and they go on a nationalistic tear, and it's about us against them. And it's scary what they're doing, and it's wrong. And no matter what you think about immigration, and we, a lot of immigrants do a lot of good work in America that Americans otherwise would not be doing, and they're not looking for those jobs. And they're here trying to find a better life, and they provide for our economy. And one of the first things I was taught when I was elected to Congress was we need a workforce. We're not repopulating right. enough. But the big thing is protect democracy, protect our government, and don't let them attack the okay. press journalism, and immigrants. All right, you get the last word. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Bill. And thank you for joining us. Join us again next week.